first of all, I'll say uh, Father John Hoy from Georgetown University uh, and also Professor Patrick Byrne from Boston College. About an hour ago, I was in Penn Station in Newark watching all the people go by and waiting for somebody to come from Washington and somebody to come from Boston. So it was quite, uh, and fortunately, I had a cell phone. So I was, Pat's uh, train was an hour late, but I was thanking God for cell phones and uh, watching the people. It was quite something. We're in the midst of a world of a lot of technological advancements and, and improvements and uh, it can help us come together. And uh, the question of religious faith and all these scientific um, advances and technological advances, how does science how does religion come together? So we have a very interesting topic today. Is the universe on our side? Scientific understanding and religious faith. Uh, Father John Hoy, who will be responding to Professor Burns talk today, has written a, a book recently called Where is Knowing Going? The Horizon of the Knowing Subject. And it highlights the contribution of faculty research to the Catholic intellectual tradition. Father John Hoy is a senior fellow of the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown University and will respond to uh, Professor Byrne's talk. Professor Patrick Byrne is the former chair and is a member of the philosophy department at Boston College. He is the author of Analysis and Science in Aristotle and the editor with Frederick Lawrence and Charles Heffling of Bernard Lonergan's Macroeconomic Dynamics and Analysis in Circulation Analysis on Lonergan's work in economics. So without further ado, I'm very happy to present Patrick Byrne as our lecturer today. Uh, thank you so much, Monsignor Liddy. It's uh, good to be back here at Seton Hall. I think this is about the fourth time I've been here. I always get such a warm welcome and um, really enjoy my visits to this campus. Um, Mrs. Norris asked me when I got here how I liked coming to the North Pole. Um, I came from Boston. Um, we had not one but two storms yesterday. Uh, one came from the south and one that hit you folks, and then one came from the west that hit us. Uh, we had, so we had a double whammy. Um, the news news reports in Boston were, uh, were were talking about how we had topped the 60 inch mark uh, of total snowfall for the winter, uh, and they joined that report with the fact that Syracuse, New York, had topped 10 feet. Um, I I grew up in Syracuse, New York. This is nothing. So. This is not the North Pole. This, this seems like a, you know, sort of winter thaw to me. So, but it's nice to be here at Seton Hall once again. And, um, and uh, I'm not sure how you folks are doing in the Big East, but go Pirates. Um, so the title for my talk today comes from a question posed by the great Catholic theologian and philosopher Bernard Lonergan. In his book, Method and Theology, he considers one of the ways that what he calls the question of God arises from contemplating the results of modern science. And he writes, is moral enterprise consonant with this world? Is the universe on our side? Or are we just gamblers? And if gamblers, are we not perhaps fools, individually struggling for authenticity and collectively endeavoring to snatch progress from the ever mounting welter of decline? And he continues, does there or does there not exist a, a transcendent, intelligent ground of the universe? Is that ground, or are we, the primary instance of moral consciousness? Our cosmogenesis, biological evolution, historical process, basically cognate to us as moral beings, or are they indifferent and so alien to us? Lonergan's questions do not come out of nowhere. They refer to widely shared assumptions that natural science has revealed to us a mechanical and random universe devoid of any sense of ultimate meaning or purpose. 
They refer to the assumption that cosmogenesis, which, the genesis of the cosmos, that is to say the evolution of the universe from what physicists now call the multiverse through the Big Bang and then through biological evolution on Earth, uh, that that process is not hospitable to authentic human moral efforts. In fact, there are plenty of scientists and scientifically minded philosophers who hold exactly this view. For example, famously in his A Free Man's Worship, Bertrand Russell remarks, even more, purpose, uh, even more purposeless, more void of meaning is the world which science presents for our belief. Amid such a world, if anywhere, our ideals henceforth must find a home. That man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving. That is origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves and beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. That all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system and that the whole temple of man's achievements must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of the universe in ruins. So that's a cheery thought, isn't it? Just fits the uh, weather outside. Um, although, um, and, and my apologies for the, uh, the non-gender inclusive language, but I am quoting Russell. Uh, although l later in the essay, Russell himself endeavors to give his own humanistic answer to this challenge, he completely accepts the idea that science tells us that the universe is fundamentally indifferent, if not hostile, to human intellectual and ethical endeavors. Again, Nobel Prize recipient and biologist Jacques Monod has written, the ancient covenant is in pieces. Man knows at last that he is alone in the universe's unfeeling immensity out of which he emerged only by chance. Or more recently still, Evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins writes, I think nature read in tooth and claw sums up our modern understanding of natural selection admirably. Clearly, several influential 20th authors did not regard the natural universe as friendly to the works of the human spirit. Among the most prominent voices giving, con uh, contributing to this prevailing opinion about the indifference of the universe is that of sociologist Max Weber. In his essay, Science is a Vocation, which has profoundly influenced the shape of our contemporary universities, Weber claimed that the rest, relentless, claimed that relentless scientific progress is part of a process of intellectualization which we have been undergoing for thousands of years, a process of mastering the world by calculation a process which means that the world is disenchanted, as he put it. For Weber, neither scientific work nor the world that it brings to light have any inherent or ultimate end or purpose. At best, scientists can resign themselves to this fate and heroically forge forward, like Nietzsche and Uber mentioned, realizing that their work will have no lasting worth and accepting their fate anyway. Let me offer one more recent comment along these lines. This is taken from a contemporary blog called SL Universe, or SLU Universe. It proclaims itself to be the oldest and largest community site for Second Life and other virtual worlds. One of its threads is dedicated to politics, religion, and society, and has hosted a very lively exchange about string theory and its implications for religion and human destiny. One of the bloggers, called Redhead, wrote, Ultimately, the universe is a cold and lonely place. That's a really difficult concept for most people to deal with. So beliefs like those of your friend help them keep safe, help them feel safe. They help them cope with the reality that the universe doesn't care about us. Believing that he is a chosen one makes it really bearable. To which another blogger responded, the idea that the universe is ultimately a cold and lonely place that doesn't care about us is just as much a belief as any spiritual explanation. Dismissing spirituality as a defense mechanism against the harsh reality of a nihilistic existence is a bit patronizing. 
Now in full disclosure, I must tell you that SLU Universe website clearly stipulates that its blog is for, quote, topics pertaining to politics, religion, philosophy, and social issues, not for the faint of heart. Also, do not post while drunk, suffering from food poisoning, or while on a, while on a low carb diet. You have been warned. Clearly, several prominent and not so prominent thinkers do not regard the natural universe as, a friend, as friendly to the works of the human spirit. In sharp contrast, however, at the core of religious belief, and especially of the Jewish and Christian faiths, is the belief that the universe is ultimately meaningful. In fact, the first creation story in the book of Genesis clo closes with the ecstatic exclamation, God looked at everything God had made and found it very good. So which is right, modern science or religious faith? Is the universe indifferent, indifferent to all human efforts uh, to bring meaning and goodness into the world? Will our efforts to make the world a better place ultimately be washed away by extinctions in the law of entropy? Or despite the law of entropy and massive destructions and extinctions of natural processes, is there an even greater and deeper goodness and meaning and purpose to the universe and to human existence? Is there something that will ultimately reveal the ultimate, re ultimate meaningfulness that transcends all the destructive natural events? This afternoon, I'd like to show that this is a false dilemma. While I've quoted several voices saying that science reveals a purposeless world, I challenge those assumptions. I will attempt to show that these are not at all accurate as portrayals of what science shows us about the natural universe. In order to make my case, I will look more closely at what scientists actually do. This closer look will reveal that there is more of a convergence than an incompatibility between scientific understanding and religious faith in a meaningful universe. In order to look more closely at what science actually does, I'd like to take as my example the science of the Earth's magnetic field. Now this is not the most glamorous or hottest of the hot button topics receiving keen attention at the borders of the science and religion debates. But the history of the scientific study <clears throat> of geomagnetism is fascinating, rich, and complex. It will give us a chance to notice some things about how scientific investigations proceed that will, excuse me, <clears throat> that will prove useful in thinking about the question of scientific understanding and religious faith. In his autobiographical essay, Albert Einstein tells us that as a boy of four or five, he was thrown into a state of intellectual wonder when his father showed him a magnetic compass. He wrote, that this needle behaved in such a determined way did not at all fit into the world of effect connected with direct touch. Something deeply hidden had to be behind things. The behavior that Einstein refers to, of course, is the unchanging north-south alignment of the compass needle, no matter how you move the case around. We, and at a later, later age, Einstein too, would now say that the needle constantly points north-south because it is magnetized and aligns with the Earth's magnetic field. But we can still wonder with Einstein about the Earth's magnetic field and the reasons for its effects. A magnetic field is not something that can be seen or touched. How can something invisible and intangible have so real an effect? That was what Einstein was puzzled at as, as a young boy. What kind of reality is the Earth's magnetic field? That is the question that has animated a very large number of scientists for almost 400 years. The first person to do extensive investigations of magnets was William Gilbert in the 16th century. He made a large number of observations about all kinds of magnets and their interactions with one another and with various other substances. He knew that naturally occurring magnetized rocks, lodestones as they were called, could in turn also magnetize pieces of metal. And he knew that magnets would align with each other. He was also the first person to answer the question about why a lodestone or a magnetized piece of metal always pointed in the same way when it was put in a compass. The answer, he declared, was that the Earth itself was a large magnet. 
But why was it a large magnet? Early voyagers knew that magnetic needles do not always point directly toward the rotational north and south poles of the Earth. There is a deviation, or declination as it's called, of magnetic poles from rotational poles. Scientists wondered about this as well. Gilbert and others followed him, following him discovered that metals were more e easily magnetized when they got very hot, and people discovered that heated clays also became slightly magnetized by the Earth's uh, magnetic field. This led them to wonder, additionally, if ancient rocks of the Earth were magnetized. In the middle of the 19th century, investigators found that indeed lava flows were magnetized by the Earth's magnetic field when they were hot, and that they held that magnetization when they cooled quickly. Geologists um, then discovered that other rocks in the geological strata were also magnetized. But beginning in the first quarter of the 20th century, as scientists explored the magnetization of rocks at ever older levels in the geological strata, they discovered something very odd. Namely, that the direction of magnetizations alternated over periods of time. Um, in this table here, um, this is a period when it was aligned the same direction as it is now, and the white periods were when it was aligned oppositely, so that your compass needle would not point north, but rather south, and then it alternated back. So the black, the black bands are the periods when the magnetization was as it is now, and the white bands were when it was reversed. And um, how could this be? The insight that magnetic scientists, uh, geomagnetic scientists came up with was that the Earth's magnetic field must be stable for hundreds of thousands of years, but then reverse its direction very rapidly, and then last in that reverse direction for also very long periods of time, and then reverse itself again. And this phenomenon must have repeated itself many times. How? What sort of thing is the Earth's magnetic field that it would do this? What is its source? Some answers came not from field observations, but from the large number of theoretical developments in physics during the 19th century. Uh, so many developments in the 19th century contributed to thinking about the Earth's magnetic field that it's impossible to talk about them all, and that's not what you came to hear anyway. So I'll merely highlight a few of those theoretical developments that were the most important uh, had the most important implications for the study of the mag Earth's magnetic field. First among these were the discoveries that linked electrical currents to magnetism. After several failed attempts by his predecessors, Hans Christian Oersted conducted experiments showing that electrical currents generate magnetic fields. Just a few weeks later, the theoretical work of two physicists, French physicists by the name of Biot and Savart yielded the differential equations for this connection. Some years later, Michael Faraday in his uh, laboratories discovered a reciprocal phenomenon, namely that changing magnetic fields would exert forces on electrical charges. The uh, theoreticians after Faraday formated, formulated this in another equation. Uh, let me just say that um, <clears throat> one of the problems of translating from Macintosh to uh, to uh, PowerPoint is that not everything translates completely transparently. Those of you who are familiar with the physics should, will know that this should be uh, a delta operator rather than an N with a tilde over it, but that's, um, that's the way it came out th on this slide. Uh, that's what makes it a differential equation. Um, these de the, together, these developments set the stage for new insights into the answer to the question, what is the source of the Earth's magnetic field? The insights were that the interior of the field was itself a, mag a metallic fluid swirling around because of the Earth's rotation. This would be like a current flowing in a wire, only in more com a, a more complex way and on a far more massive scale. The massive electric current would generate the Earth's magnetic field. This first insight led to another one, that the swirling itself might be accelerated by the very magnetic field that it itself generates. So it seemed that these physical laws, along with several others, would reinforce one, each other under these very unusual and special circumstances. The Biot-Savart law would determine that moving electrical charges would generate the magnetic field. 
The law derived from the work of Faraday would determine that the magnetic field would exert a force on the swirling charged molten uh, metal and re-energize its motion. This reinforcement would produce what is called a dynamo. In addition, the laws of gravity and pressure would help keep the metal hot and in a liquid state, and the rotation of the Earth plus the laws of that dynamic fluids would supply the needed conditions of stability. It is actually a lot more complicated than that uh, and required quite a number of further experimental and theoretical insights, but I think you get the idea. Now, this insight about the Earth as a dynamo ran into a difficulty, however. In the 1930s, using complex mathematics, of the theoretical developments of the previous century, Thomas Cowling published a theoretical paper in which he called into existence uh, such dynamos and said that they, they really couldn't be maintained. And then it took many years of further re theoretical research to arrive at the insights needed to show that the Earth's, dynamo, the Earth's dynamo is theoretically possible after all. This development is interesting for our, uh, the purposes of our discussion this afternoon because it reveals that the very same set of scientific laws can be combined in different and ingenious ways to yield very different kinds of results. And I'll return to this fact in a few minutes. Another outcome of these theoretical advances was the discovery that there can be two different solutions to the dy dynamo equations, and that these solutions have exactly the reverse polarity to one another. As the authors of the definitive work on this topic observe, quote, Thus, provided that there is a transitional mechanism, reverse and normal states are expected from dynamo theory. This comment shows how these amazing theoretical developments help to answer the questions about the reversed magnetic polarities of the ancient geological strata of rocks. Apparently, the Earth's magnetic field does reverse itself after long periods of relative stability. But just what is that transition mechanism that brings about these reversals? In a recent interview on National Public Radio, one of the authors of the book on the subject said that this was one of the questions that he wished he himself could find the answer. This is what got me interested in this topic, uh, hearing this, uh, this interview with um, one of the authors. Now, shortly after publishing his famous paper on relativity, Einstein himself said something very similar that the origin of the Earth's magnetic field was one of the most important unsolved problems in physics. Certainly, both theoretical and experimental scientists have found fascinating answers to an amazing number of questions since Einstein made that remark over 100 years ago. And yet, still more remains, and yet, still more remains to be understood about the Earth's magnetic field. Now, at this point, some of you are wondering, what lesson I wish to draw from this little summary of the history of geomagnetic science? Good question. Now, there are three main lessons that I would like to draw. First, while this is a fairly specialized field of scientific investigation, its features are very similar to those found, I would argue, in all scientific disciplines. The most fundamental feature of scientific investigation found in geomagnetism and other sciences is this cyclical rhythm of questions and answers. As soon as the answers to some questions are proposed, more questions follow soon after. As they do so, the emerging scientific understanding becomes more refined, more intricate, and more complex. Some questions emerge from observations, um, some emerge from theoretical developments, and the questions from observations lead to theoretical questions, while theoretical answers feed back questions to experimental problems. This process of questioning and answering questions is at the very heart of scientific, the scientific enterprise. The second qu uh, lesson that I wish to draw is that this very process of questioning is a seeking of intelligibility. By intelligibility, I am following Lonergan's lead. Intelligibility is what we come to know when we have insights that answer our questions. Intelligibility is what makes sense of the puzzling observations and questions that we pursue. By their ongoing questioning, therefore, scientists are seeking the intelligibility of the universe. They are assuming that the natural world is intelligible, that it makes sense, and that it makes sense to pursue that intelligibility. 
um, they are assuming that it makes that it's meaningful and that its meaning can be understood by using scientific methods. Scientists set out to find out what those intelligibilities are. Once again, Einstein had a, an astute observation when he wrote, but science can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration toward truth and understanding. This source of feeling, however, springs from the sphere of religion. To this there also belongs the faith in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational, that is, are comprehensible to reason. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without that profound faith. For Einstein, faith in the intelligibility of the universe, its comprehensibility, as he put it, is the foundation of science. Now, there are various kinds of intelligibilities and meanings, and I am certainly not claiming that natural scientists pursue every kind of meaning, nor am I claiming that the faith uh, in the kind of intelligibility that underlies a scientific enterprise is the same as the intelligibility that is the objective of religious faith. So there's faith at the basis of science and religious faith. I'm not saying they're the same, but I am saying that there's more compatibility than you would have gathered from the quotes that I um, uh, had up there a few minutes ago. But intelligibility, what we know when we finally understand something, is at the core of every kind of meaning. Whether that is the meaning, uh, whether, whether that is understanding the meaning of a puzzling comment by a friend, or the meaning that makes sense of magnetization of rocks, or the intelligibility that assures us that there is meaning and purpose to the universe and human life as a whole. That's the second lesson, that science is about intelligibility and faith in intelligibility and pursuit of it is a foundation of science. The third lesson I wish to draw from this narrative of the history of science is that the kind of intelligibility that science pursues is not visualizable or tangible. Recall Einstein's remark about his wonderment when he was a little boy, namely that the compass needle behaved without being touched and manipulated to point in a certain direction. Nevertheless, as Einstein was to say, uh, so we cannot see or touch the Earth's magnetic field. Nevertheless, as Einstein was to say some years later, the invisible magnetic field is, for the modern scientist, as real as the chair on which he sits, unquote. So the magnetic field, even though it can't be seen, is as real as the chair in which you sit. Its intelligibility is the reality. The reality of the natural world, therefore, is never completely exhausted by the senses, by what we see or touch. The reality of the natural world is intelligibility. Now, scientists have composed diagrams of the Earth's magnetic field, um, such as the one that we saw before. But those diagrams are not actual pictures of the physical reality. The reality of the magnetic field is not orange or yellow or blue shapes so that one could see the gigantic swaths of color uh, of which the diagram is just a miniature. Rather, the reality of the Earth's magnetic field is expressed in complex equations. The only way to uncover the meanings of these equations is to do the hard intellectual work that is involved in understanding them and all their complexities. When we understand the intelligibilities that they express, then the equations become meaningful. And we know the intelligible reality of the magnetic field. It is these meanings, these intelligibilities of the universe that science seeks to comprehend. However, scientific investigation does not seek every kind of intelligibility. There are some kinds of meanings that are beyond the reach of scientific investigation. The specialized methods of the sciences are not designed to yield results about the realities and intelligibilities that are the concerns of religious faith. So the methods of the sciences and intelligibilities, uh, I'm sorry, so the methods of the sciences themselves are not adapted to deal with questions of ultimate meaning any more than religious practices are adapted to yielding answers to scientific questions about the Earth's magnetic field or anything else. Nevertheless, there are questions that arise from within the context of natural science itself, but point beyond it. And among these are the questions to which religious faith offers further answers 
about further kinds of intelligibilities and meaning. In order to clarify what I'm getting at, I'd like to focus on those theoretical developments that played such crucial roles in the development of the um, uh, uh, geomagnetism. As I indicated, uh, those theoretical de developments had to do with the discovery of laws of heat flow, fluid dynamics, and laws that connect electricity and magnetism. However, it's very important to be careful about the term laws of science or laws of nature. When we use the phrase scientific law, we tend to think of natural forces in control of the natural world and is determining everything that happens in it. Uh, the famous uh, uh, mathematician, physicist, and philosopher uh, Simon de Laplace had this notion of scientific laws in mind when he pronounced his famous doctrine of determinism, that the outcome of everything is controlled and determined by scientific laws. For him, scientific laws would be like perfect totalitarian dictators. But law is just a metaphor borrowed from the realm of human political affairs. It can only be extended to science and the natural world with caution. In fact, the scientific principles that we call laws of science really do not have the capacity for this kind of totalitarian control. On closer inspection, we notice that almost everything called a scientific law in physics is in fact a differential equation. We saw this in the case of the laws that entered into answering the questions about the Earth's magnetic field. Now one of the chief characteristics of a differential equation is that it is very indeterminate and therefore very limited in how much it can control, control it can exert. What I mean is that differential equations are open to a wide variety and wide range of concrete solutions just as the, the equations about the dynamos revealed. A vast range of different possible arrangements are completely compatible with differential equations. This is because the laws that, um, that, uh, that, the laws that our differential equations can only be solved, can only be given specific forms if the actual conditions of the particular situations are also supplied. The equations have to be applied to given situations, but they do not dictate what those situations must be. The laws don't tell you what the situations must be, they just tell you what form uh, physical processes will take under a variety of different situations. But about those situations, they don't have anything to say. Um, <clears throat> the laws themselves are indifferent to the situations and contexts to which they ap apply. They don't determine the conditions under which they are applied. Far from governing everything that happens in the universe, the influence of these laws of science is rather limited. They explain what will happen if the conditions are specified, but not what those conditions must be. In order to illustrate this point uh, more concretely, let me offer three more illustrations in addition to the example that I drew from the Earth's magnetic field. The first one I draw from Isaac Newton. The second of his famous laws of motion is actually also a differential equation, which one much simpler than we saw in the case of the Earth's magnetic field. But his great achievement was not only in discovering his four great laws, the three laws of motion plus his law of gravitational force, but in combining them to provide the explanation of the planetary system. But in order to demonstrate that the planets follow elliptical paths, he had to use much more than his four laws. He had, he had to add in the specific circumstances of arrangements of masses and relative motions of the planets and other bodies in the solar system. Unless scientists are given something other than those four laws, something that tells them the conditions under which those laws are operating, no orbit can be derived from the laws alone. Newton's laws are perfectly compatible not only with elliptical orbits, but also with circular, parabolic, hyperbolic or orbits, and even straight lines. The difference is not due to the, condition, to the laws, but to the conditions under which the laws operate. Just what specifically are the masses uh, of the planets? What are their velocities and their directions? Newton's laws cannot answer these questions. His laws are completely compatible with all sorts of conditions of masses and motions, but they don't determine them. 
The laws point beyond themselves toward conditions under which they have to operate. So they're not such totalitarian or omnipotent laws after all. They're merely indeterminate laws. They depend on something that they cannot provide. And in so doing, they raise a new kind of question. Why are the conditions of the universe the way they are? My second il illustration comes again from my, my buddy Albert Einstein. He went beyond Newton just as Newton went beyond Kepler in finding more profound and accurate laws of science. When he finally worked out his general theory of relativity, he formulated what is called his differential gravi gravitational equation. The simplified version of the equation masks the even more complex differential equation that it abbreviates. And I'm only displaying it here to use as an illustration of the same point. Namely, this equation says that the kind of space and time that we live in is dependent upon the complex arrangements of energy and motion and radiation in our universe. Einstein's differential equations reveal that space and time are themselves unknowns. The actual structure and actual unfolding of the space-time structure of our universe could be any one of a dazzling, infinite ar array of possibilities. Which actual possibility is the one that our universe is? This depends upon that T symbol at the uh, far left of the equation, far right of the equation, excuse me. Uh, that T symbol points to something beyond the differential equation itself to the actual given distributions of energy in stars and black holes and radiation fields and dark matter. Why do we inhabit the space time that we do rather than some other possible universe? This is a question that Einstein's equations do not answer. Einstein's equations can answer what kinds of universes will evolve under a variety of different energy conditions. But why are those the conditions the ones to which his equations apply in the real world? Um, they can only point beyond themselves by raising this question. But the answer to the question, Einstein's laws must pass over in science. When we ask not was, what was the initial arrangement, but why was that the initial arrangement and not some other, Einstein's equations fall silent. Finally, I want to argue that the same is also true for Darwinian and Neo-Darwinian evolution. Um, this is uh, a, a slide that uh, in the upper left-hand corner is a map of the Galapagos Islands where uh, Darwin uh, had his great insight about the uh, mechanism of evolution. And uh, You see there uh, the various species of finches uh, that populated the different islands in the Galapagos and down there in the bottom left um, some of the different species of iguanas that he encountered. And he was greatly puzzled because there was no real physical difference in, in in rock formation, in climate, in, in access to water and uh, rainfall and so on. Why would there be different species on different islands? That was really the question that, that he had to find an answer to and that um, natural selection and uh, variation uh, gave him the answers. Um, although they're not differential equation, Darwin's laws of random variation and natural selection also point beyond themselves in ways comparable to what I suggested about Newton and Einstein and the mag Earth's magnetic field. Random variation and natural selection only operate in and through existing organisms. The neo-Darwinian laws depend on and are conditioned by the present generation of existing organisms. The law of random variation needs to have, an existing, have existing organisms within which it can bring about variations. Likewise, the law of natural selection, the struggle for existence, also presupposes some specific diverse population of potential competitors, food sources, and mates. If an organism exists all by itself and undergoes variation, it will not be subject to the law of natural selection, for it will have nothing else with which to compete or reproduce. Excuse me. The law of natural selection can play itself out in an endless variety of ways. Just how many, just how natural selection unfolds is the actual course of evolution. It will depend upon the arrangements of pre-existing organisms that make up concrete environments and ecosystems. This is a diagram from uh, the late Stephen Jay Gould, 
showing two different ways in which um, evolutionary process can be thought of. Uh, I'll return to uh, discussing this uh, in a moment. Um, so how it plays itself out depends upon the pre-existing organisms that make up the concrete environments and ecosystems. Those environments are the given conditions under which the laws of variation and selection can operate. Uh, those environments, in those environments, the new variations will either survive, propagate, or perish. Neo-Darwinian evolution does not, in and of itself, determine that any particular environment or, of organisms must exist for it to operate upon. The lawfulness of neo-Darwinism does not stipulate that certain kinds of organisms must exist. It just deals with whichever organisms happen to exist. Uh, the law of natural selection does not give itself its organisms. It only stipulates the manner in which populations do, in fact, evolve. This is a diagram. Um, of the organisms that were reconstructed from the fossil record in what are called the Burgess shales. Um, and Gould goes on to explain that, that almost none of these organisms have any survivors. So even though these would have been proto-organisms, some of them uh, eventually evolved into the forms of organisms that we have uh, extant in, in the world today. But only two of the something like 13 different um, uh, family types, uh, phyla types, are, uh, actually survived uh, to, to, to propagate. And, and um, uh, Gould wonders about this. Uh, my favorite creature, some of you probably know about this, but my favorite creature is this fellow right here. Uh, it's called Opabina. I'm not sure why it got that name. Uh, if you look very closely, the slide's uh, resolution is not perfect. It has five eyes. Uh, there is no species or genera or, or family or class uh, of any, any organism that has five eyes. Uh, they all have two or four or six and so on. Uh, that, that ancestry uh, got wiped out, Mr. Opabina. Um, why, why not, uh, uh, so why are those the populations that neo-Darwinism <coughs> mechanisms operate with? Why not some other set of organisms that would have drastically tipped the course of evolution in a different uh, fashion. So this is, or, this, this is um, um, Gould's um, argument that, that all these strains that could have developed into kingdoms uh, or phyla of creatures uh, that were present in the, the time of the Burgess Shales uh, all petered out except for these two, which led to all the all the uh, animal forms that we now have. They differentiated and evolved and so on. And um, Gould says, you could run the tape again and you might get a completely different uh, evolution, evolutionary pattern, because it's so contingent on what the environment happened to be like. Uh, so that the, the laws of natural selection and variation do not absolutely determine what kind of evolution had to happen. And so we have to ask ourselves, well, why did the kind of evolution happen that happened rather than some other kind which was equally possible and compatible with the very same neo-Darwinian mechanisms? An obvious answer seems to be that in the previous generation, uh, neo-Darwinian laws themselves produced the organisms that now once again will cause it to vary and struggle for existence. In other words, why do we have the organisms that we have now that natural selection and variation are operating on? Well, natural selection and variation gave us this generation from the previous generation. Uh, but this just pushes the question back one generation, only for it to rise up again, all the way back to the emergence of the first organic entity. And then we can ask once again why certain prebiotic molecules occurred in their unique and special arrangement rather than some others. Why do we have the life forms that we have rather than some others that could have emerged from different molecular combinations? So neo-Darwinian laws point beyond themselves, but neo-Darwinian methods are not up to the task of asking, answering these questions. Now I've proposed that science is fundamentally a set of practices for pursuing and finding answers to questions for intelligibility. I've now pushed this reflection to show that <clears throat> from within scientific practice itself, there arise questions seeking understanding of an intelligibility that lies beyond the province of science to answer. That is, something is always uh, given to which scientific laws can be applied in answering its questions. 
but by their very nature, scientific laws do not and cannot answer the question, uh, questions about why those circumstances, are, those are the circumstances to which they apply. Um, in this way, I propose a certain kind of questioning arises from within the process of doing science, which points toward an intelligibility beyond the scope of scientific methods. Let me take this step, this reflection, yet another step. All these scientific laws are themselves merely conditional in yet another way. Whether we are considering the laws of motion, gravitation, heat flow, fluid dynamics, electromagnetism, magnetism, relativity, or Darwinian evolution, they did not have to be the laws of our universe. Other laws are easily conceivable. The law of gravitation could have taken on a very different mathematical form. So could the laws of electromagnetism. Life did not have to evolve. It could easily have been a static ecosystem. In fact, of course, the physical universe does not actually behave according to the laws of Newton's thought. But it could have. Likewise, although it could have, the biological world doesn't evolve exactly in the ways that Darwin thought. Uh, but it could have. More recent developments in evolutionary theory have revealed that Darwinian's ideas have to be uh, supplemented um, and uh, modified. Um, that we first held uh, a Darwinian and now ever-changing versions of neo-Darwinian synthesis as the best scientific explanations means that there's nothing absolutely necessary about those laws as laws, not only about the conditions they operate about, but also about the laws as laws. The universe did not have to evolve in neo-Darwinian or Einsteinian ways. Um, the laws, therefore, once again point beyond themselves to questions they do not and cannot answer. The laws of science raise for us further questions. Why are these the forms of the laws that our universe has? These questions lead us to wonder about something about the universe beyond what can be known by scientific methods themselves. Why, are, why do the events of our natural universe follow uh, these laws rather than some others? As Bernard Lonergan observed, these are implicitly questions about God. We are asking about something beyond the questions of science. We're no longer asking uh, the questions with which science directly is concerned. Um, how are the, namely, how are the events of the universe related to one another and by what intelligible laws? We're asking about why the universe is the way it is. We're asking about what makes sense of the mere givenness of the laws and the mere givenness of the conditions under which the laws operate. We're asking for what makes sense of the mere givenness of all things. In doing so, we're tacitly assuming that there are no such things as mere brute facts with no intelligibility. Although these are questions that go beyond the realm of scientific intelligibility, they are not alien to scientific inquiry. They are completely compatible with the questioning and findings of science because they share with science that deep human spirit of questioning. These are limit questions that arise out of the enterprise of questioning in the search of scientific intelligibility. They are questions that ask about the limit of all questioning. Lonergan proposed that it is possible philosophically to come to a kind of answer about the question um, answer to the question about the limit of all questioning. That limit, Lonergan argues, would be what he calls the unrestricted act of understanding. The insights that come as responses to limited questions um, uh, about the specific features of our universe uh, are insights. By way of contrast, an unrestricted act of understanding would be the unlimited, in, unlimited insight that grasps the intelligibility of everything about everything. Lonergan explores the characteristics that would be true of such an unrestricted act of understanding and shows that these are the characteristics that religious faiths traditionally attribute to God. As he remarks, our subject has been the act of insight or understanding, and God is the unrestricted act of understanding the eternal rapture glimpsed in every Archimedean cry of Eureka. Most significantly for the purposes of this afternoon's talk, Lonergan goes on to explain that this passionate, unrestricted act of understanding would also understand the ultimate intelligibility, 
the ultimate reason why the order of the universe is the way it is. That, after all, is one of the qu answers that would be known to a being that does understand everything about everything. That is to say, God understands the transcendent value and purpose that make it worthwhile to realize the actual universe with all its given laws and given conditions. Because of God's unrestricted understanding of the value of our universe, therefore, the faith underlying scientific endeavors is justified. And to return to the place that I began this lecture, this also means that the universe is not a cold and lonely place without meaning or value. The affirmation of the ultimate intelligibility of the universe contradicts Bertrand Russell's claim that our hopes, fears, loves, and beliefs and the labors of all ages and devotion and all inspiration are destined to extinction. What seem to be mere brute facts about the laws and conditions of our universe are revealed to possess a higher meaning and purpose by the value that God bestows upon the universe. God's infinite understanding understands the goodness and purpose of the universe and the human place within it. As Lonergan puts it, God's unrestricted act of understanding is the ground of value and the ultimate cause of causes for it overcomes contingents at its deepest level. So in answer to Lonergan's original question, to the extent that we, are not, that we not only pursue scientific understanding, but also endeavor to live by faithfully asking and answering our questions about what we should do and what is the right way to live, to that extent, the intelligible universe is in ultimate harmony with our efforts to be intelligent and responsible. We are seeking to bring about an intelligibility to our lives that is consonant with the intelligibility of the universe, that is not, after all, a disenchanted universe, but a universe alive with meaning and purpose. Now, Lonergan would agree with Max Weber uh, to this extent. The methods of the natural sciences themselves would have to leave the question of the ultimate meaningfulness of the universe undecided. Although the sciences do reveal a universe shot through with intelligibility and meaningfulness, the question of ultimate meaningfulness must be deferred to another non-scientific method of inquiry. Lonergan takes up this, <coughs> Lonergan takes up this post-scientific question by means of his philosophical method. It would be a topic for a separate talk to adequately explore Lonergan's philosophical case for the existence of God as an unrestricted act of understanding and for what he can know, what we can know about uh, what God understands and knows. But scientific knowledge and philosophical knowledge are not the only kinds of knowledge. Religious faith is also a form of knowledge. Toward the end of his career, Lonergan frequently remarked, faith is the knowledge born of religious love. By religious love, Lonergan meant unconditional love, the love that is the very being of the God who unrestrictedly understands everything about everything. God understands everything about everything by loving everything unconditionally. And especially God understands the ultimate meaning and value of all the universe by loving it and everything in it unconditionally. Lonergan argued that God communicates and shares that unconditional love with all human beings. In support of his idea that God bestows the experience of unconditional love on all human beings, he used to quote St. Paul's letter to the Romans, um, that the love of God has been poured out in the hearts, in, into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Faith understood as what people know because God has shared God's very being of unconditional love is the way that most people come to understand that there is meaning and purpose in the universe. This is how most people find assurance that the value of their efforts uh, to improve the universe and to make all human life better. Few people undertake the long and demanding work of philosophical reflection required to arrive at a personal affirmation of the ultimate intelligibility and meaningful uh, meaning of the universe in a, in a philosophical fashion. For most people, the ultimate meaningfulness of the universe is implicit in their most basic faith religious faith commitments. In the throw of unconditional love that God pours into the heart of human beings, the world is experienced as more than mere matter, more than mere random occurrences, more than brute fact. Faith born of unconditional love discerns 
that there is transcendent meaning and purpose beyond the limited forms of intelligibility known through scientific investigations. Faithfulness to God's gift of unconditional love means understanding that there is ultimate meaningfulness because one is in the throw of that love even though one does not understand quite what that meaning and purpose is. Um, yet by itself, neither the gift of God's love nor the faith that follows from it, um, neither of these are appropriate sources for direct answers to scientific questions. So on the one hand, it's inappropriate to introduce premises about ultimate value or purpose or their divine origin into the conduct of scientific investigations. On the other hand, this also means that the question of the ultimate intelligibility and meaning and purpose is undecidable by the scientific methods themselves. For that very reason, the scientist as scientist, or the philosopher relying on findings of science, ought not to pronounce on the existence or non-existence of a transcendent meaning or purpose of the universe. Both of these attempts are unwarranted intrusions of one kind of human pursuit into the field of the other. Scientists as human beings may respect or join with believers in their affirmations of ultimate meaning, but reject any attempts to answer scientific questions with um, sources from religious intelligibility. On the other hand, believers may esteem the achievements of empirical scientists, but appropriately reject their denial of the transcendent meaning as going beyond the realm of, of their own scientific justification. Now let me conclude by saying then that the ultimate meaning made known by religious faith provides a ground for a confident response to Lonergan's questions. Yes, those who endeavor to live authentic and ethical lives are neither gamblers nor fools. They are rather genuine participants and contributors to an intelligible order that includes cosmogenesis, biological evolution, and human history, and is ultimately meaningful, valued, and authored by God. Thank you. for escape. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. It's like uh, commenting after uh, a seven-course dinner or something like that. Um, so I'll be very brief. So those of you who need to escape, escape. <laughs> Classes are ending now, so maybe yeah, we'll give take a, a minute break. Okay, Father Bush. The last couple of days we've been we've been watching uh, the drama going on in Egypt where there's a faith, a whole num a number of faiths, but a faith in democracy. And then action taken because of the faith. Reasonable action, unreasonable action taken because of a faith. So this connection between faith and reason, the way Pat has been developing it, I just want to make a couple comments about it. On the train coming up from Washington today, I read a book, uh, was reading a book by a Brian Greene on string theory. And Brian Greene is one of these people who thinks that in the course of this century, we will develop a grand unified theory of everything so we will understand uh, everything about everything. 
at least everything about everything uh, scientifically. Pat is one of these people who's been uh, exploring meaning for the last, how many years we've known each other, 20 years or so. And he, he just amazes me uh, at uh, the data that he takes in. He's always amazed me and he's always made me feel a little bit stupid. He's to me uh, an embodiment of uh, one of those people who uh, is restive um, about what the, uh, the intellectual tradition of Catholicism represents. And yet he continues to be a person who identifies with the Catholic doctrinal tradition. So when and if uh, we have the Third Vatican Council, I, I'm gonna recommend that Pat be one of the Pariti in the Third Vatican Council. Five years ago at Woodstock, we had a, a woman, uh, Monica Helwig, uh, leave 10 years of being the president of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities, where she did an incredible job of trying to uh, uh, connect uh, ex cordia ecclesia, which was John Paul's ideas about what the, uh, what the Catholic university represents uh, with the understanding of church that, uh, that John Paul has and had. Anyway, after 10 years of, of those efforts, uh, extraordinary efforts, she came to Woodstock, uh, where I am, the Woodstock Theological Center at Georgetown. And she was really uh, passionate about an idea. And she was gonna do a book on this idea if it killed her. And the idea was a simple one, uh, and it kind of summed up her experience of 10 years working with faculty at Catholic colleges and universities. And the idea was that uh, every faculty member that she knew was emboldened by a faith, a faith. Faith in understanding, faith in reason, faith in reasoning, and therefore faith in research, and faith in growth and intelligibility. And in a number of cases, maybe the majority of cases, faith in God. Although the God they understood in the faith that they embraced would not have been the same uh, understanding of God. It was a faith in reason, and they would spend their lives and did spend their lives aligning their faith with their reason and their reason with their faith. I would say that probably sums up not just me, but I suspect all of you. The effort to align faith and reason, reason with faith. Pat's particular uh, elaborations today were on scientific reasoning, the intelligibilities that science seeks, and then the meaning of those intelligibilities that science seeks, and then the effort to, to take the intelligibilities that science seeks and attains, but then continues to seek with faith which keeps yawning out into uh, an unknown. It seems to me this, this is really uh, the great thing about a Seton Hall, a Georgetown, um, all of these uh, institutions which represent a, an intellectual tradition like Pat himself, there's a restiveness. We come into a university like this as um, administrators, faculty, students, staff, 
uh, always with this passion to align faith and reason, reason and faith. There's always an enlargement that goes on because we keep learning more things. And the more things we learn, the more questions we develop, the more intelligibilities we develop, the more satisfaction we develop, the more dissatisfaction we develop because we have new questions. It seems to me this, I, I don't know that I, uh, that I would um, concern myself so much with scientific understanding and religious faith. I guess I'm uh, more uh, maybe uh, anthropological than philosophical about this. Anthropological in the sense that I don't know how any mind can function unless it is moved by faith, at least faith in reason, and then the insistence on the reasoning being right, and getting it right, and getting it straight, and making a whole out of that which comes from faith and reason. We're whole makers. I don't know that there's any such thing as a mind that's not trying to make a whole out of parts that intrude into the mind, disassembled, and then we want to make something which comes together, comes aligned, becomes one, becomes whole because of that. So that's really, that's really all I have to say. I, I, I'm fascinated by the enlargements that are taking place in my consciousness and hopefully in your consciousness because of what science is learning. It's simply astonishing to me. Uh, about uh, two months ago, I, I, for the first time in my life, I got interested in why space and time were to be aligned into something unitary. And then the relationship between space-time and the Christ that I have um, believed in and followed. And the more I, I learn about space-time, uh, the more my, my faith changes. It doesn't change to become no faith. It just becomes faith in a way that it hadn't been before. The last comment I'd make is Augustine would say, the more you know about nature, through science, if you will, the more you'll know about God. And we can approach our faith and take for granted that what we hear about our faith is so, and then we can just take what we hear on faith, about faith. Or we can think and then go through the enlargements about faith that, that somebody like uh, that Pat Byrne embodies. So I, I, I thank you for your paper, and uh, and I also thank you for your your, uh, your your life of trying to put put together uh, a whole from parts. So come on up and answer the questions. <laughs> some time for some questions, at least a few questions. And, um, see, 
I had a question. I read Pat's talk before, and I'll just, and one of it was the, the importance of mathematics um, for modern science. And Plato had a big deal on mathematics, and I, I think even in Augustine you find that's sort of, that's so important, but your talk really sort of emphasized the role of mathematics as freeing us to see dimensions of the universe that we would never have seen if we weren't able to think mathematically. Anyway, just a short reflection on that. Yes. Doctor, um, talking from the point of view of somebody who's just recently, meaning within the last 12 months, read and mostly understood both insight and method of reality. That's a uh, remarkable achievement. <laughs> well, I'm 64 years old. I had to prepare a long time to get to the point where I could actually do it. <laughs> and I do mean that sincerely. It took me 64 years of life to get to the point where I could go through insight page by page and uh, sometimes get tired, but not. Um, then I went uh, on the internet, and there's a thing out there called the Stanford uh, uh, Dictionary of Philosophy. And I went to look up Lonergan on the deck on that on the uh, Stanford Dictionary of Philosophy. There's no entry for Lonergan. So immediately being a, a mouthy sort of person, I sent you know, a contact uh, email to uh, the editors of that and said, why not? I, it has so much to say about philosophy of science, at the very least, with his explanation of classical science and statistical science, uh, and the empirical methods involved in it, that at the very least, I can't see how anybody could graduate with a, with a PhD in any of the sciences without having uh, studied methodology at that level, in which case you'd have to read Lonergan because he's got so much to say. You have to either take him or refute him, but you can't ignore him. Right? All right, so my question to you, and I, I'll bet it can't be answered, is why the heck isn't Lonergan more well-known <laughs> in the uh, secular world? Uh, and you know, that, that's a question that has bothered me for almost as many years as you've been reaching up to the mind of Lonergan. Um, and and I, don't, I don't have a good answer. Um, but let me, let me begin by saying it's partly my fault. Um, I haven't done as good a job of communicating the importance of Lonergan's thought as I should have. Um, you know, there's a variety of reasons for that, but uh, ultimately at the bottom there's a bunch of excuses. Um, and um, so I, I think that's part of the answer, that, that those of us who, like yourself, have seen the great value of what Lonergan has to offer uh, to so many um, discussions, not only in the, the boundaries of faith and science, but uh, in many other areas. Um, his, his biggest interest, odd, oddly enough, or perhaps surprisingly enough, was the philosophy of history. He, he worried from the time he was a, a young man in his uh, early 30s about the fate of the human, human race uh, and uh, wanted, to, wanted to do something that he thought would be a lasting contribution to make uh, human history be, be a, a better outcome. Uh, so there's, there's a great many things that he that he has a great deal to contribute on many different fronts. Um, and uh, so, and part of it is um, people like myself haven't done as good a job of communicating it. Um, part of the answer also is that he's a very difficult thinker, um, as, as you know. I mean, so, so you, heard, you heard this gentleman uh, refer to the book Insight. Well, Insight's 750 pages long. Um, and uh, it is not exactly a page turner. Uh, it, it, it requires a huge investment of time, and people want to know why should I invest that kind of time. Um, and uh, for what it's worth, I've been struggling with that book for probably as long as you have. Uh, I'm almost the same age as you. Um, so it's a difficult book, and that's an answer. Um, one thing I am really certain of is the fact that he's got a chapter about knowledge of God. Uh, means that people won't read the book for that very reason alone. Uh, there's just, a, and I've heard that over and over again, uh, there's just an outright prejudice that if the man thinks God exists or if the man thinks you can give him some kind of a philosophical 
uh, argument for the existence of God. He's got to be wrong, so why bother um, reading him? There's, you know, there's something, uh, so I've heard that. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, it, the, the idea that he's a difficult thinker hasn't uh, stopped people from reading Kant or Hegel or Heidegger or Foucault or Derrida uh, or any number of other you know, major philosophical figures in the 20th century. But so why Lonergan's not known, I don't know. I don't know. But this man has all the answers. Uh, one comment on, on uh, you and Pat and me and, and one senior Liddy. Uh, I, I like the way Joe Flanagan put it. Uh, if Flanagan doesn't introduce you to yourself, you've misunderstood him. Uh, so I, I've kind of backed into Lonergan myself. I, I've only uh, sought out his understandings from a question that I've had. And a, a number of books that I, that I wrote, uh, I, Lonergan was the last thing in my mind until I got into some kind of a cul-de-sac. And then uh, something he would clarify was, was very helpful to me. So if you become a Lonerganian, you don't understand him. Well, let, let me begin by saying um, I'm not as knowledgeable of, about Aquinas as I am about Lonergan and Einstein and some other figures that I talked about. Um, you know, Aquinas is, a, is an extremely comp complicated and subtle thinker. Um, um, and uh, it, it, at the very end of his book, Insight, Lonergan, <clears throat> Lonergan says um, that he spent um, many years, it's, it's really something more like uh, 15 years, as he puts it, reaching up to the mind of Aquinas. And he said, uh, I, thought, I think there were, there were two conclusions that I came from. First of all, is that reaching up changed me utterly. And secondly, that that change was worth everything. Um, so he had great esteem for Aquinas. Uh, he certainly thought of himself as a follower of Aquinas um, and casting Aquinas in a contemporary mode, particularly bringing Aquinas into dialogue with contemporary modern natural science. And uh, the other thing he thought was with uh, contemporary um, understanding of history and human development. Uh, that said, my experience of teaching uh, the opening uh, questions of the uh, Summa, Summa Theologia. Um, this, the, this, the, the response I get from students is something like this. The, they're the, the, the famous five ways. Um, the first one is the way from motion. And Aquinas draws upon what he learned from Aristotle and, um, 
and argues that um, that whatever is moved <coughs> is moved by something else. Uh, that this can't have, there can't be an infinite regress, and therefore there has to be a first mover. Uh, Aristotle's own way of spelling that out, uh, particularly in the physics and other things, is uh, is much more detailed. And Aquinas has his uh, commentaries on that, so he really knew what Aristotle was saying. But that particular point. Um, in the Summa, he doesn't go into those great details. But the experience I always have with students is, why couldn't it go on forever? You know, what, what's wrong with an infinite regress? Um, I, there was a, a touch of that in, in my talk, which you may have noticed, when I asked the question, um, well, where do, the, where, do the, where do the ecosystems that evolutionary mechanisms operate on, where do they come from? And the answer could be, well, they came from the previous generation and were produced by natural selection and variation. Um, and then I said, well, you could trace that back, and you could trace it back to the prebiotic chemical arrays out of which the earliest life forms emerged and so on. That's a way of raising the question about the infinite regress. Um, Aquinas knew why there couldn't be an infinite regress, and Aristotle did also, uh, and it's not it, it isn't a, 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 the simplest of questions to answer, but Aquinas doesn't actually answer it. It just presumes everybody knows there can't be an infinite regress. Lonergan has a different way of coming at it. Um, he, he argues um, independently of raising the question of God, first of all, is that reality is completely intelligible. And if it's completely intelligible, anything that is merely conditional, the way I was describing um, the, the kinds of ways that um, scientific investigations tries to look at the conditional, um, that, that that can't be the whole story. So Lonergan doesn't say there can't be an infinite regress. And what he does is to argue that, that reality is completely intelligible, and if completely intelligible, then there can't be any such thing as just a mere brute fact. That is another way of coming at the, at the question of the existence of God than Aquinas's, that, that you might say uh, Aquinas is doing it, looking at the head and Lonergan's looking at the tail. Uh, it's a parallel way. And I think Lonergan, and Lonergan is clearly quite indebted to Aquinas's mode of, uh, uh, of approaching the question of God. Um, but he recognized, I think, quite well that you need to address the question about why there can't be an infinite regress. And he took this, this approach. So he's very much in the spirit of Thomas. Um, He's doing things that he thinks uh, brings uh, Thomas's uh, ideas into a contemporary mode that address contemporary issues, and um, and meeting some of the questions that were that were uh, that Aquinas understood but didn't make explicit. I don't know if that if that's helpful. <clears throat> the, the value of, of Lonergan to me was. Uh, he, he, he allowed me to see how completely rich each subjectivity is. There's never been a person like me before. There's never been a Tony Padamano before. So you take into the world for all kinds of reasons and go through the, your life, my life, our life, our epoch, our culture, with unique experiences. And then open yourself, as we all are enabled and invited to, to understandings, understandings that come from the past, understandings that come from eking it out yourself. And then coming to, to judgments that you try to verify, and then act in terms of the judgments that you verify. What, what was valuable to, to me about Lonergan and, and continues to be valuable is each of us glorifies God by taking responsibility for that which is unique to us, our understandings, our experiences, the judgments of others, and then the judgments that we make on the basis of the evidence that we have and the data that we're privy to, and then act in terms of uh, an alignment with that. Uh, that so anyway, in, in a word, Lonergan's turn to the subject 
Uh, and then seeing the operations that function in our subjectivities, that, that's what's been so helpful to me in my respect for the otherness of the other and my respect for my own subjectivity as I come to uh, understand whatever. Could, uh, just just f follow up that briefly. Um, I didn't. I didn't expect this to become a discussion about Lonergan so much um, as I, I thought it might be more of a discussion about issues about faith and religion. But given that we've we've talked about that, one one of the things that that um, that that I learned in my own studies of Lonergan is that this question about uh, learning about who who I am uh, very much for me became a discovery um, that that the, the being that I am is a being who plays a part in a grand drama, a uh, being who plays a part in the drama of my family, obviously, uh, of my, uh, my school, my, uh, my neighborhood, uh, my country, um, the, the grand drama of, uh, of human history. Um, but just as, as importantly and, and significantly, that um, I play a, a part in the drama, the cosmic drama, the drama of the whole universe. Um, I don't think I could have gotten that from anybody else. Um, that this business about self-appropriation, I'm not sure how many of you have studied any of Lonergan's work or what those phrases might mean to you. It sounds a bit like Cartesian introspection. Um, and, it, and there are moments when it looks like that. Um, but there's this really stunning moment when you realize that the, what this is all about um, is discovering the fullness of your place in something that's, that's quite wonderful, um, but you're only a part of it. Uh, it's very humbling, and as uh, Father Hoy just said, it um, makes you aware of the others, the otherness of the others, and that they too play this very profound and, um, and uh, um, uh, deeply significant role, uh, and that to really know yourself is to know yourself as being part of something in which people quite different from yourselves, and for that matter, planets and, and molecules quite different from yourself, are, are playing roles um, that are equally, that are they're part of something valuable. And without any of those things, that value wouldn't be realized. Um, it's both elevating and humbling at once. It's really quite an astonishing thing. I want to thank Father Foy and Pat Byrne for a, a tremendous uh, dialogue this afternoon. Uh, if anybody wants to stay and have a conversation with them, that's fine. But I just want to give them a big hand for...